Hey, what's up, YouTube? This is Harley, and thanks for checking out this video. So today I wanted to talk about Covenant C2. Um, hopefully you've already heard about a C2, and so you kind of have an idea of what it is we're talking about here. But if you don't, that's okay. Uh, basically, a C2 stands for Command and Control, uh, and it's something that the attackers definitely are using to try to build out what's called botnets. Um, but we also use it here on like the red team pen testing side to try to kind of well, when we compromise a system, we just want to have better control over them in, in bulk. Um, and so we use tools like Covenant to actually install little agents on every compromised machine. And then now we control those computers and we can perform really bulk actions on all of them, across all of them, uh, pretty easily and simply. So I'm going to show you today Covenant. And in this video, we're going to walk through how to actually get that set up and installed on a Windows 10 machine. Let's dive right in. All right, guys, so before we get going too far, I do want to ask that you go ahead and hit the like button for me. That will help out the channel a ton as I go through and try to build out my audience and, and get more and more people kind of involved here. Um, and thank you already if you are a subscriber to the channel. That, uh, that helps show support and lets me know that people are actually liking what they're seeing. So anyway, enough of, uh, enough of the plugs. We're at this GitHub page for the actual Covenant, um, I guess, like where you can go out and download it. And this is the official installation guide. You can find this by Googling GitHub Covenant. I'll throw a link in the description, so feel free to check that out too. Um, but there's actually some prereqs that we're going to need first. So before I actually go out and try to do any of this, I do need to make sure we have the .NET Core 3.1 SDK installed. So I'll throw this link in the description too. If you don't want to trust links, I totally get it. Um, feel free to find this out on your own. Should be pretty simple to find with a quick Google search. Um, but I'm just going to download this because we're actually going to be building Covenant ourselves on our machine. So we're going to need this in order for that to work. The other piece that we're going to want is uh, Git for Windows. That will make it super easy for us to just download all of the files that we need. Um, if you're in Linux, I actually don't know if you can run this this program in, in Linux. I don't think you're going to be able to. Um, but anyway, that's okay. This is a, a Windows walkthrough. Let me get this installing here. So while that's going, we can download Git for Windows. Save that. And both of these pieces, they, they install pretty quick. Uh, it shouldn't take too too crazy long. So once this finishes installing, the next thing I'm going to do is install this Git for Windows, this guy right there. And then we'll be ready to go ahead and move on to the next step of the process. So we'll give this a second, and uh, I'll see you once this green bar finishes loading. All right, just as I say that, it finishes. So I'm going to hit close. Then we'll come in, and we'll run Git as well. Now, this one, it's going to ask a ton of options here. I just choose defaults on everything. So feel free to just kind of read through these and see if they make any sense for you. But for me, defaults work just fine, especially for what it is that we're doing here. So we've got those two pieces going. Uh, we've got the .NET already, and then now Git is installing. I will pause the video here. Feel free to pause if you need to, uh, and I'll see you in just one sec. All right, cool. So that finished up. I'm not going to launch it yet. I don't need to view the release notes. We're just going to say next because I want to make sure that it launches uh, in an elevated session. So I'm going to actually come in and we'll do run as admin. I'll say yes. And then now we've got like a, a pretty little terminal window. And I don't know if I can make this cool. I can't make it bigger. So I'm going to go ahead and start by just changing into our C drive. And then in here, I want to make us, ourselves a, a directory. I'm going to call it op, just because I kind of like I kind of like Linux, and I, I'm used to putting all of my my tools in the op directory. And then we'll change into it, and we'll just see. There's nothing in here at the moment. Okay, so now that we have this directory, I'll clear the screen. And before I actually move forward with installing uh, Covenant, I want to come into settings here, and uh, I believe it's under System Security. We can also just search for Defender, and we could just disable 
defender because Covenant will be picked up as malware. Um, so if you have an antivirus program, you're going to either need to disable it or do what I'm about to do, which is just coming in and, and making a exception. So under real-time protection, if I turn this off now, it's probably just going to turn itself back on. So instead, I'm going to come into, I believe, add or remove exclusions. And then I can just specify a folder that we're going to exclude. And then we'll find that opt folder we just created. OK, so now that we have the opt folder excluded, anything we put in there should not be scanned. And we won't have to worry about dealing with AV and all that mess. So we'll come into here. And this is the command we want to run which is just going to go out to the GitHub repository and pull down the Covenant installation for us. And I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm in Copt. OK, great. So then we'll just paste this command in. And it's going to go out, and it's going to download all of the files that we need. And it's going to clone it here into a directory called Covenant. And this shouldn't take very long. I don't think there's a need to pause the video. Um, but once this finishes up, we should at that point be able to actually install it and get it going. Uh, I'm also going to spin up real quick. Let me move this over here. I'm going to spin up a quick victim machine. So that way we'll have two different computers. So this is just going to be a victim Windows 10 computer. And we'll let that load up here in a second. But looks like our installation finished, or at least our download finished. So now what we can do is actually change into that covenant directory that got created. And we actually have a subdirectory called covenant we need to go into as well. We can list out everything in here. We see we've got all this stuff, right? Um, none of that really matters. We just need to run .NET run. This is why we needed to download the SDK earlier. But this is going to go out and actually perform the installation. And it's going to build covenant for us. And it makes it to where we just don't have to worry about that. And <laughs> looks like I had to do a. Uh, like a check disk or something on the victim machines. But that's OK. We'll give it a second here to finish up. And any second now, this uh, this build should finish as well. On the victim computer, I'll go and just sign in as our user. Oh. OK. So I mean, what we're looking at is the left side where I'm actually installing this, this is going to be our command and control center. So this computer is going to be definitely like the attacker or the pen tester, something that we control. And you can even put this up in the cloud. You may even choose to do that. That way it'll be globally accessible from multiple networks. Um, or as long as you've got access to a, a Windows computer that you can control and that it's safe for you to really install malware onto uh, within the network, then you can put it there as well. Um, OK, so the installation finishes will say allow access. So that way we can allow everything through the firewall. And Covenant has now started. So we can just copy this address. We'll come in here. And we'll head on over to it. Bam. All right, so we've got the Covenant, Covenant web interface. And we can just go in and create a user here. So I will do infinite logins. And we'll throw in a quick password. And we'll register that user. Great. So this is the Covenant dashboard. If you get here, that's awesome. That means that the installation has completed. Um, so cool. I mean, technically, I could do a, a stop here and, and end the video. Um, but I want to go ahead and just take it one step further and show you how to build a, a listener and how to actually get a launcher running on that victim that we spun up here a sec ago. So the first step in the process is to create a listener. This is basically going to open up a port on our computer, on our Covenant server. And it's going to be listening for any incoming grunts, is what they call them. And grunts are, are basically our bots. They're, they're our victim machines that we have control of. And the way you get a grunt is you create a launcher, which will connect back to the listener. So first step, we'll create a quick listener. The name here can be that random string. That's cool with me. I do like to change this bind port because uh, I, I probably will later end up hosting this listener, or sorry, hosting my launcher on a web server. And maybe I'll want to use port 80 for that. Um, if you're in a real engagement, you may want to consider using a popular port like 80, 443, or even like 53, because 
you may have your victim computers, they, they may be like filtered by a firewall. And if that's the case, if you use like a weird port, like 4444, there's a good chance the firewall is going to not let that traffic outbound if they're doing any any good egress firewall filtering. So you may want to use like a legitimate port or somewhat legitimate port. I'm going to use 8081. Um, it's not like super common. Oh, 8081. It's not really super common, and this would probably be something that a, a solid egress firewall filtering rule would, would take, uh, you know, I guess kill the connection on. But that's okay here. I don't have any crazy firewalls in play, so I think we're good. So we'll use 8081 and SSL. We can leave, leave that to, to false here in this, this proof of concept. And we'll say create. I don't want to add too much complexity with trying to deal with certificates and things like that. So we've got our listener started. Um, but we may want to verify that it's actually listening, right? You never really, you never, you can't always just trust your tools. So, so um, sorry if this is small. I'm just going to do a quick net stat. And let's just pull out anything that's listening. And we should see, yeah, cool. Port 8081 is listening on all interfaces. So this confirms we do have our listener set up. Port forwarding, or sorry, not port forwarding, but... Um, the the listening port is now configured there and then we can come into launchers and covenant has a ton of options for us to be able to create a launcher with um, in this case we're dealing with a modern operating system of windows and it's running windows 10 so i'm just going to come in and we'll say powershell because that that seems to work pretty pretty well most of the time and default settings for the most part seem to also work for me what I will do is I will remove uh, this window hidden parameter just because I don't necessarily want to hide the window when I run it here. On a real engagement, you probably will want to hide that window. Uh, basically, that'll just make it to where when you run the PowerShell command on the victim that calls back and, and connects to our Covenant C2, you don't want a, a PowerShell window stuck open and users wondering, hey, what, what, what's going on here? So in our case, we'll leave that open because I do kind of want to show it. And we'll just say generate. Now, there's tons of ways to actually get this launcher on the machine, right? We could download it, we could host it up, and then we could try to execute it over a network share um, or over an HTTP share. Um, but in this case, what we're assuming here is that we've got some sort of command execution on our victim machine, and we're able to inject this command. You could even take the encoded launcher. Sometimes that helps with some AV evasion. Um, but encoded, the, the payload here that's encoded also is sometimes easier to use tools like crap map exec or um, any other way to try to get like remote command execution and have it be a little bit more stable, right? Because not always do symbols work with those tools like you see here in this top one. But I'll just copy out this top one. There's no need for us to go through encoding. And then we can come in here to PowerShell or victim. And I'm just simulating, you know, some sort of command injection. Now, this could be an exploit, like a remote command execution exploit that I have, or maybe I just have access to this machine through RDP. Maybe, I, you know, I, I compromise some user credential and I can just sign into the computer. Maybe I have physical access and I just walk right up and, and paste this command in, you know, through the, through the keyboard. What, whatever method I use to actually run this command doesn't really matter. All that matters is we get this command. We paste it on in, and then we say enter. So because we said on that uh, parameter up here, we didn't, we got rid of the the hidden window parameter. The window will stay open for us. And so now, if we scroll up, we can see, hey, check that out. We've got a new grunt logo has now been activated. That's a that's a host name of this system. If we come in here, we can just verify my device name is logo. So if we come back, we can look at the grunts, and we see Logo is connected here with a high-integrity shell. And uh, we can see what user it is that ran that, that for us. And now we can come in, and we've got all kinds of different things we could do. We could hop right into an Interact shell, and I'll just kind of zoom out a little bit. Or we can come in, and we can run any task and stuff that we want. Maybe I'll zoom back in so you guys can actually read it. Um, and we've got all kinds of tasks that we can run here. And again, I don't want this video to drag on too much. I can make additional videos if this is something you guys want to see. But I, I do want to show you a couple things that I think are really, really cool. Like, for example, we can come in and we could say, let's run a keylogger for 10 seconds. And I'm just going to task that up. 
So now I can come into the actual victim machine. In Notepad, I'll say this is a keylogger, and I'm going to keep typing. Please subscribe. Cool. And now if we head back over to kind of the attack server, we could see that the keylogger times 10 second was tasked and, and it was progressed. And we see that Notepad was launched. I use the uh, the shift key here and I started to type, this is a keylogger. I use the shift key and did a capital I. Going to keep typing, right? Please subscribe. It sees that I even had a couple backspaces here and it finished the keylogger. So, I mean, I'm sure you can imagine how powerful this could be, right? Like somebody could uh, have their, their passwords actually keylogged, or maybe a sensitive email can be keylogged as, as the user's typing it. So that was really, really cool. What else can we do? Well, let's take a look. Let's come in here, and we even have the ability to come in, and we can say, let's take a screenshot of the system. So we'll come in, and we'll query or uh, queue that up. Now, one thing I do want to mention, um, what we're looking at here isn't really like a reverse shell in the sense that the connection is always sitting there. It's always listening. It's always running. Um, in this case, what's happening is I think every five seconds or so, this grunt is going to be checking back into the, the command and control center. And it's going to say, hey, do you have any commands for me to run? So if I come into the tasks menu and I queer, uh, queue a, a bunch of stuff up, once the, the grunt checks in, that's when those, those tasks are going to be executed on the machine. So it could take a bit. It might not be quite as snappy as what you might be used to if you're used to dealing with actual like full-blown remote shells. But anyway, um, yeah, you can see that screenshot processed. And there was no indication on the victim machine that any of that was going on. One other thing I do want to point out, uh, or I guess kind of showcase here, is the SAM dump. Because I think that one's really, really cool to see. So we can task this up, come back to interact. We see that it's tasked, and we'll give it a second here for it to actually be processed. But you'll be able to see here in just a second, it says completed. Let's see, there we go. So it utilized a tool called Mimikatz, and it was able to elevate to system. And that's because when I ran that PowerShell window on the victim machine, I ran it as ad admin. So we have full administrator rights to this computer. But then we were able to actually dump the SAM database. So now I actually have, uh, let's see, what user account is this? It doesn't really say, does it? Here we go. I've got the administrator user hash right there, the NTLM hash. I even have the local user user accounts hash, which is actually the user account that's currently signed in. And then I've got another user here called dlillard, and I've got that user hash. So I could take these hashes, and maybe I can go offline, right? Try to crack them, pull out the, the clear text equivalent. Or I could do some, like, pass the hash type of attack and see if maybe any other computers on the domain might be utilizing the same uh, user account credentials. Anyway, that's, that's kind of like a quick overview of how to set up Covenant and what it looks like once you actually have a grunt running and a couple easy tasks that, that are really, really powerful. So I hope you found kind of any sort of value in this. Um, I'm going to make another video that shows how we can leverage a tool like CrapMac Exec to pass a bunch of, uh, of launchers around a network and, and actually get, you know, multiple grunts installed simultaneously uh, as long as we have like a valid domain admin account or, or valid administrator account that has valid credentials on multiple machines. So stay tuned for that one. I think that one will be really, really cool to see. And let me know what you thought of this one and if it was of any value to you. Until next time, I will see you guys then.